Nikesh, I want to ask you, you know, you're known to be, you know, when I ask people at Google, what is the one thing Nikesh known for? They say, you're known for pushing the envelope and being very unreasonable. So... I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but I'll take it, so. <laughs> take it as a compliment. <laughs> so, do you remember the first time, I mean, when did you get into this habit? Do you remember when you start, first started pushing the envelope? See, I don't see myself as somebody who's pushing the envelope. I just see myself as trying to get stuff done. And in trying to get stuff done, sometimes, uh, I guess, assertiveness can be interpreted as pushing the envelope or being unreasonable. Yeah. So, do you remember when you were a kid, were you always, were, did, were you somebody who teachers said, why do you ask so many questions? I mean, where did this start? Yeah, I didn't quite ask as many questions as I should have uh, when I was a kid. But you asked more than everybody else? No, I preferred yeah. sitting in the back of the class and preferred not being in the class, to be, to be honest. From that, to, when did your real inquisitiveness, interest in learning begin? I'm pretty sure the real inquisitiveness was there. I suspect it, yeah. wasn't, uh, it wasn't channeled appropriately in school. You know, when I was in 10th grade, there's this exam in India called the National Talent Scholarship Exam. And for reasons of perhaps not related to studying, but I ended up taking that exam. And when I did, I ended up getting one of those scholarships, which is at that time was only given to 200 people in the country. And I woke up and said, I don't think I'm that smart, but I guess I ended up getting one of those. So when I was in school, my teacher asked me to go speak. It was a moment uh, we were supposed to speak at a competing school, and my topic was polymers. And I made my first speech in my life standing up in front of people on polymers. And I wrote copious notes since I'd never stood up in front of a bunch of people. I was the nerd, the geek uh, who spent his time studying, and I kind of lost that piece of paper. At the tender age of 17, it can be extremely harrowing when you have to stand up in front of hundreds of people and talk about polymers, and we've kind of lost your script. And from there on, I sort of promised myself I would never take notes, which made much sense. I'd just stand up there and speak. I think that was the time when, when people around me started pushing me up, saying, this, this kid is smart, uh, maybe he knows more. But how did you make through that? You gave the talk anyway, you knew more than you thought you knew, or you just... You know what happens in history is that the reason we all end up being happy people in life is because we romanticize the past. So I have no memory of what happened at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> But I made it through. In each of our lives, we have multiple inflection points that take us from one thing to the next. Just share maybe one or two inflection points in your life. I don't know if there's a particular inflection point as such as there is more of a set of feelings that you carry around you. And uh, in my life, I've always been restless. I've never been able to settle with status quo. Every time I felt that life was getting boring, life was getting unexciting, I decided to pick up and move and do something different. And I've actually never had a plan. So people, I, you know, I go speak at places, people ask me, so did you have all this charted out? And I've never had a plan charted out. I still don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. As long as you're happy, as long as you feel you're making a difference, as long as you feel that, that your restlessness is getting satisfied, which again is an oxymoron, because once your restlessness gets satisfied, you're no longer restless and you have to be restless again. So I always try to be restless, always try to do something different. I grew up in this country, I you know, ended up um, being an engineer, decided I didn't want to do that for too long, uh, which was a bad choice. Now that I'm in Silicon Valley, I realized I should have stuck to those guns. But anyway, um, decided to become a business person and decided to go to business school in the US. I landed there with two suitcases uh, and a pair of white socks, which I still remember fondly, but that's part of my romanticizing again. So from there on, you know, I graduated business school again. I went to work in the financial industry. When I was applying for jobs, I was told that you don't have enough finance. So since I, so from then, I went and got two more degrees in finance. So every time I felt that I, I've been challenged, I've gone and picked up my bags and done something different. So I got bored in Boston. I picked up the same two bags and went to Germany and decided to work in Germany where I didn't speak over to German. And the average peer group was 50 years old. Right. So there are many moments in our lives when we come to that point to realize what would have happened if I had gone the other way or what if the doors had shut sooner before you walked into the train. Yeah. And yeah. you can go back and think about those moments in life, but it's not about those moments, it's about the moments when you actually walk through the door. One of the things when young people read about you, or anybody reads about you, we only see what you've accomplished today. Did you ever have a time in your life where you tasted failure or you fell down? Or how do you deal with things in the unhappy moments of your life? I have romanticized those moments in my life away. But, uh, you know, there were moments when I graduated out of business school in the U.S. It was 1992. I was married. Um, 
and I didn't have a job and my choice was to go back to India or come back to India and figure out a way to return $5,000 to my father since I had borrowed $5,000. And I'd sent 450 letters to different people asking for jobs. And I still today have every one of those copies of 449 of them which rejected me, uh, saying, no, you're not worthy. And I still have those letters in my, in my house. And when I feel like you know, something is not working out, it happens many times in life, I actually go back and look at those letters. And I've even actually carried one of those letters to the CEO uh, who actually had signed the letter and still was the CEO of that company. So there are times when I go back and say, you know, there were times when I was looking for a job and I couldn't find one. So and I should be very happy. You take it back and say, na 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 or something like that. <laughs> no, no, not quite. I usually he's, go back and say, he's... thank you very much <laughs> for not giving me that job. <laughs> but anyway, thank you for the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. You.